God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And also for the Easter greeting, He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Will you please join with me in prayer? Holy God, you commanded us not to be afraid, and you assured us of your presence. In the midst of trials and joys, sorrows and dreams, may we know your presence and rejoice. Grant us courage, O God, to take delight in your spirit in all times and all places. Grant us faith, O God, to see you in the myriad of ways you can give life. Grant us hope, O God, to participate in your work in the world. Grant us love, O God, to welcome, respond, and act with compassion in all we say and do. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. It is wonderful to be with you all here in this time of worship. To our longtime members, to our first-time guests, we're glad that you all are worshiping with us virtually. I encourage you to let us know that you are here by signing our virtual friendship register, which is leaving a comment in the comment section or putting your name in the chat box in our YouTube feature. We're glad that you all are with us. We're glad that we can still worship together to get to the central part of what it means to be followers of Christ together. We have a number of announcements that we'd like to draw your attention to. Coming up this Saturday, May 30th, we are celebrating at Claymont Preschool three retirements. These are for Lisa Marsh and Becky Pierce and Kay Sherrill. As they are retiring from their service at Claymont Preschool, we are going to have a parade for them. They are going to be sitting in driveways on Claymont Drive. Uh, they're going to be at the Locks House, the Berry House, and the Lion House uh, just down the street from the church. And the preschool is inviting all members of the congregation to come by. They will be out there for about an uh, they'll be out there from 11 to 12 for that one hour sitting in the driveways. And we are so thankful for their love, for their care, for their compassion, for their service. So that is coming up this Saturday from 11 to 12 on Claymont Drive. Also, uh, we are recognizing that this is the last week of school in our area. School that is certainly different as it ends at, than as it began in as we prepare to go into the summer months, uh, we're going to be celebrating our graduates as well. And we encourage you to uh, contact P Pastor MP with any notes of encouragement, uh, any memories that you'd like to share with these graduates of uh, congratulations. And so uh, you can contact Pastor MP by sending her a email or by giving a call to the church office. Also, uh, one final thing is just to announce that uh, this year we were scheduled to have a picnic that was coming up on uh, the beginning of June. And obviously with the situation such as it is, uh, we will not be having that this year. We've already made some plans for next year and for that time when we can get back together. So please update your calendars. Uh, this is the final Sunday that we get together, the final Sunday of Easter. Next week is Pentecost Sunday. It is the birth of the church, the arrival of the Holy Spirit in a new and unique and Sunday. And on Pentecost way. Sunday, we will have an additional worship service in addition to our 1030 worship service online. At nine o'clock, we will have a drive-in worship experience here at the church. We did that for our Easter service, and we're going to do that again for Pentecost. So I invite you to join with us online at 1030, but then at nine o'clock in the morning before that worship service to come in to participate in the safety of your car as we worship together in the parking lot. Also for Pentecost, we take the Pentecost offering, which is an offering for at-risk youth in our area and also nationally and globally. And so uh, we encourage you to give to that as well, in addition to normal tithes, offerings, and gifts. Now, as we continue in our worship, I invite you to please join with me in our call to worship. Who remembers the way things once were? Take courage, children of God. 
Continue in good works, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Take courage, children of God. The God of exodus and exile is calling us back. Take courage, children of God. God's spirit abides with us, so we will not fear. You are invited to please rise as you are able for our first hymn today. Hymn number 35, Praise Ye the Lord, the Almighty. Him for he is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise ye the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reign. Shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires e'er have been granted in what he all that is in me adore him all that hath life and breath come now with praises before him let the amen sound from his people again gladly for a we adore The scripture reminds us that the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Confident of God's promise of forgiveness, let us be real with God. Let us be honest with God and with ourselves as we go to the Lord with our unison prayer of confession. Will you please join with me? Holy God. We come before you a broken people in a broken world. We confess that we have ignored yet again your assured presence. We forged our own paths and chartered our own waters. In the name of independence, we ignored your aid, your comfort, your peace, and your promise. We called upon you in desperation rather than recalling your mighty and faithful acts in all times and places. Forgive us. You have been with us in exile and liberation. Be with us even now. Let us take a time of silent confession. Amen. The scripture reminds us that as far as the east is from the west, so far has our God removed our sins from us. So friends, hear and most certainly believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we all are forgiven. Thanks be to God and amen. And as forgiven people, we are given peace. And so I declare the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us rise as we're able to share that peace with those who are worshiping around us and also share that peace virtually with those who have gathered to praise God's name. We are continuing in our journey through the story. We are in chapter 19. This week it covers Ezra, 
It covers Haggai and it covers part of Zechariah. We are near the end of this journey through the Old Testament. In a few weeks, we will be in the New Testament. We will hear about Jesus. But everything that we are talking about right now is part of the foundation of not just Jesus' appearance on this earth, but his life and his ministry, his miracles, his teaching, and his salvation and his purpose that comes through his life. Last week, we heard about the exile that occurred in Babylon. We knew in previous weeks that the prophets, prophets kept warning the people, saying, if you do not turn, then there will be this judgment that will befall you. Well, that judgment happened, we heard about last week, and the people being in Babylon, and they were displaced from Jerusalem and from Judah. It happened in phases. They were not removed all at once, and the poorest people remained in Judah. Now, this took 70 years there are generations that are born in captivity, in exile. There are generations who rise, who live their lives, who die in captivity, living in the uncertainty of a foreign land. And in our reading this week, we hear that after these 70 years, that they begin to return to Jerusalem. Again, this too happens in phases. And some people never even return at all. We'll hear more about that next week in the story of Esther. Ultimately, this is a good news chapter in the story, the good news passage. It is good to be back, but it's also very important to notice what the people have left undone. And so we go to Haggai chapter 1. Haggai is not a book we normally hear from in the church, so I invite you to listen to it. I invite you, perhaps, after the service is done, to read through it on your own. It's chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. And it went to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtal, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Is it a time for yourselves, for you yourselves, to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now thus, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, Consider how you have fared. You have sown much, and you have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And you, you that earn wages, earn wages to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You have looked for much and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house lies in ruins while all of you hurry off to your own houses. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on the soil, on what the soil produces, on human beings and animals, and on all their labors." Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheatel, and Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai, as the Lord their God had sent them, and the people feared the Lord. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have moved several times as 
a family. Places in California and Alabama and southwest Missouri. We've lived a number of different places in a number of different places. Some of these felt like home and others simply felt like they were houses. Like we were living in somebody else's home. Now many people can relate to this. And many people, frankly, can feel like they've never been home at all. It might be their surroundings. It might be their psychology. There are those who have never felt like they fit in at school. They fit in at work. They fit in with neighbors. And sad to say, even at church, they look around and feel like they do not fit in. They feel out of place. Today's message is not just about returning home. But it's also about finding a peace with ourselves individually and a collective peace as we live and as we work and as we serve, no matter what the situation holds outside. The key to finding peace is finding our center, finding what is most central in our world and in our lives. In acting, they would say, what is your motivation? What is your core in our own lives it's the question of what is our chief end what is the most central part of our life and our existence and we've heard a lot over the past couple of months about essential and non-essential jobs and after so many moves i believe there are plenty of things in my life things that i value but things that are not essential. The children of pastors understand this. The children who grew up in the military with military parents understand this. Sometimes you can only take what you can fit into a suitcase or what you can load in the back of a moving truck. You have to restock the non-essentials when you get to the next location or perhaps more importantly, you discovered that you never really needed these things in the first place. Now, the Israelites who were taken into captivity, into exile, they left everything behind on the move there. And after 70 years, 70 years, they are leaving things behind as well. Some good, but many bad. In exile, they were a displaced minority, mocked and ridiculed by those who lived in privileged positions. And so they made their homes in Babylon, but they were never really home. And even as they are freed, even as they make their way back to Jerusalem, they carry their belongings, but they also carry the emotional baggage from so many years with them. So many years carrying this baggage in their hearts. And I think many of us can relate to that. And so I look at this time of self-quarantine. I look at this time of what is essential, what is not essential, and I think the scripture passage speaks wholly and completely to what is most important. It's been difficult for all of us this time, but likewise, there are blessings along the way. There's not everything has been bad. In fact, there are and have been and will be unanticipated and unexpected blessings in each of our homes. One of the things I was thinking about this week is the ability to eat dinner together every night. Now, this occurred far less frequently when things were normal because of practices or games or performances. And so so it is something of a blessing right now that we get together every day and we talk more. And any time we can get together with family, with friends, It is holy space. It is sanctified space. Our conversations, I'm noticing though, they are evolving from lamenting what we have lost to looking forward to what will come, to hoping in the future. That question is asked, when we get back, and the answer, the first thing I'm going to do, the first place I'm going to eat, the first location I'm going to travel 
Perhaps you've had conversations with others. Maybe these are just conversations swirling around in your head. When we get back, when this is all over. There's good news in today's passage because what felt like always, which is exile for the people of Jerusalem, always is never forever. And after 70 years, they get to go home. This is good news. There are some people who never left. There are some people who will carry this baggage with them. And for years, they asked the question, of when by the waters of Babylon they asked the question when in the midst of pain and suffering they asked the question when in hope and in desperation they asked the question when when can we go back many of you are asking that exact same question right now when when is the church going to open back up when will we be able to get Back together. When can we return? And I don't know the right answer right now. I know that there are other churches, there are other businesses, there are other activities that are starting to open up right now, but I believe it will happen when God shows us it is safe. Now, I recognize this might not be the most satisfying answer that I can give, but it is honest and it is real and it is born out of a compassion for every member of our church, every guest in our midst. And it also has the unintended blessing, the hard and sometimes harsh blessing of having to learn patience and perseverance and pray for guidance. So the first question we ask is, when will this happen? The next question, the following question, is what will we do? I saw a cartoon the other day that had God and the devil talking. And now I don't know the right theology of this or if this kind of stuff is accurate. I tend to think not. But the devil mocks God or is, is acting all high and mighty saying, I closed all of your churches. And then God responds, Jesus responds by saying, Yes, but I've opened up a sanctuary in every house. We know the church is important, but in the end, it is brick and it is mortar. It is stained glass and pews. But more than that, the church is people. And the church has left the building. And yet, I know buildings matter. And yet I know this space matters to each and every one of you, especially on the Lord's Day when we come together to worship. It's not just a building, but it is a place, a place to worship God and a sanctified place, a holy place that we can do our life together. Seventy years before our passage, the invaders ransacked and invaded Jerusalem and decades before our passage they destroyed the central part of that city which was the temple the central place of worship is also central to the Hebrew identity as the people made their way west out of exile from Babylon to Jerusalem I imagine unrecorded conversations they must have had I wonder about the stories that they shared, wondering about how it will feel. They started to make plans, and I'm sure they made plans saying it will be good to rebuild the temple. But plans burn off like the morning mist as they go over the crest of the hill and they see that city. They return to that city, and then all of life begins to happen for them once again. There were other things they were going to do first. And so days turn into weeks. Weeks turn into months. Months turn into years. And there still is no temple. There still is no center. That's a lot of what we're hearing about in today's passage from Haggai. I remember a, a conversation I had with my best friend growing up in Springfield, Missouri. And 
named Wes, and, and Wes always described our hometown as a suburb in search of a city. Growing up in the late 70s throughout the 1980s, there was a lot of truth in that. I witnessed the slow death of the heart of the city. At one time, the heart of the city in the center. It was not a church, but it was the downtown square. Businesses began to abandon the city center for the mall on the edge of town. It was as if the whole city was a group of planets orbiting, but there was no center. There was no gravitational pull. My hometown was whitewashed windows and vacant stores. I started thinking about the people coming to Jerusalem and what they must have seen and what they must have felt. I think about in our new hometown of St. Louis and the love of exploring the city, the love of our family, of, of what we want to do, which is get back out and do that. Again, the vibrant things, the markets and the theaters and the neighborhoods, but also to go see those places that are past their prime, to go see those spots that are now dilapidated, some that are worn by the ravages of time and indifference and others which have been completely torn down to their foundations, existing only in fading memories or the unread page, pages of unread books and unnoticed books. Driving through the city, Sarah and I have different things we want to see. Sarah wants to see the schools. I want to see the churches. But they were built in times where dreams were big and the buildings were majestic. Now, Many of these majestic cathedrals are in the middle of working class neighborhoods. But the churches are exquisite. Each church was the central place in the community. And I look at these churches, many with stained glass that is busted out, long since abandoned. And I see it as a hard truth. But I also, when we see it through a lens like today, I believe there is hope as well that once was great can still be again. But it is not easy. There is a lot of hard work involved. And the Israelites come back to Jerusalem. Maybe they had the same feeling as they looked at the destruction, as they looked at the despair, as they looked at the dilapidated and destroyed structures all around them. Many of these people were coming to a place, they were coming home to a place they'd never been before. And after months and after years, there still was not a center. It was a city in search of an identity. Instead of restarting with a place of worship, we need to hear that, friends. Instead of restarting with a place of worship as being central, they restarted the family business. They rebuilt homes, not just homes, but homes, we're told, that were paneled homes, nice homes. And they ran into the same familiar problems. Twice, the Lord says through Haggai, consider how you have fared. Maybe another way of saying that is, how's that working out for you? You kept doing the same things. You kept trying to eat, but you never got fed. You tr kept trying to drink, but you never got your fill. You kept trying to clothe yourselves, but no one is warm you kept trying to earn wages, but you put it into a purse or a wallet with a hole in it. Haggai says, you need to do things different. You have restarted the same way and you are getting the same results. The prophet calls them, implores them, says the reason things aren't working out is because you don't have a center. You need to rebuild the temple. You need to rebuild the temple to start with the foundation that is unshakable, that is immovable. You need something at the center that is bigger than yourselves. A place of worship, absolutely, but also a daily visual reminder that God is in their midst. And the God that has brought them safe thus far is the God who has led Israel and us home. And I believe even in this time of pandemic that God blesses us. Sometimes these are unexpected. Sometimes these are hard. Sometimes these are even harsh. It is always a call to return fully back to the Lord. 
and when we've been displaced by virus or calamity or when we are just simply poor in the spirit to hear the Lord say, come back to me, come back to the center, come back home, set a foundation in the middle of the people, says the Lord, return to me, but do so with purpose. The old ways don't work. The harder we run, the more tired we feel, the more acclaim we seek, the more lost we feel, the more money we earn, the more poverty of spirit we experience. I don't know when we are going back. I only know what God is calling us to do and to be. And that's to seek first the kingdom of our God. Seek first the kingdom of the Lord and its righteousness. And then and only then will all these other things be added unto us. When worship is at the center, when we find ourselves in the middle of worship, worship not just on Sunday, but throughout our week, when that is central, then we will find ourselves the proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. So as we ask the question, when, may we know the answer and live out the answer of what? In the name of the Father and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Now we have come to the time in our worship service where we stand together, if able, and recite our affirmation of faith together. We will be using this morning the Westminster Catechism's Shorter Catechism, Question 1. What is our chief end? Our, our chief, chief end, end is to glorify God and, and to enjoy God, God forever. forever. Please go ahead and have a seat. God has given us the gift of Christ, risen and ascended for the life of the world. Therefore, let us offer our gifts in return that others may know this glorious news. Let us pray. O God of all glory and majesty, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son and his power at work in our lives and in our gifts. Bless these gifts of time and talent and treasure for the benefits they offer in bringing life to others in your name. Bless our lives that we may be your witnesses to the end of the earth as we love and serve you, O God most high. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us not cease to give thanks to God, who has seated the resurrected and ascended Christ at the right hand of the Holy One in power and great glory. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, O God, in this and every age, for the healing power at work in Christ to fill our world with grace. We pray for our world, for our leaders, people, and nations, that we may exercise a spirit of wisdom as we serve the common good. Shield all who suffer from the terrors of violence and war. Bring them to safety and new life in you. Make us one family gathered up in your love and clothed in the power of your peace. We pray for all who long to experience the immeasurable power of your love. Open our hearts to sing your praises and to share the story of your blessing that all may come to know our living and ascended Christ. Bless your people everywhere with food and shelter, health care, 
and employment sufficient for our flourishing, that all may thrive together by the riches of your grace, and fill us with joy for justice that inspires us to do our part for the prosperity of all. God, we pray for those dealing with natural disasters, floods and hurricanes and earthquakes. We pray for all in sickness or in need, those who are suffering addiction and poverty and hunger, that they may know your healing love and the power of Christ to bring life in the most difficult times. Keep us mindful of your hope and the great power that we have in you as we offer your healing to others. And we pray for all those who have died, that together you will bring us to our glorious inheritance in Christ, the one who fills all in all, in whom we find our home. And now, God, we lift up to you in this moment of silent prayer, those prayers we hold in the secret places of our hearts. All this we pray in the name of him who raised to live and reign in power for us, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand now if you are able to sing our next hymn, hymn number 435, There is a Wideness in God's Mercy. Now, as you go out into the world, a world that is filled with so many questions, with so many asking when, may we focus on what, what we are to do, who God is calling us to be. May we keep the love of God at the center of our lives, at the center of our calling. And when we go out into the world, may we find ourselves strengthened 
May we be a light to other people, showing them God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, God's forgiveness in all that we say, all that we do. May we go out and be the church. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may it be with you this day, this life, and always. Amen.